We're dealing with the Democratic Party now. I, I, all, all things else aside, very unpopular. Joe Biden's unpopular. Vice President Dome is unpopular. The party themselves is, are unpopular. And they're going to gun grab. This is not a winner, or is it? Historically speaking, guns are a major, major losing issue for the Democratic Party. So for, for, the, for the love of God, I actually have no idea what they think they're trying to do here. The polling numbers for Democrats this fall are abysmal. Joe Biden's approval ratings are low 40s, high 30s, depending on the poll. Depending on precisely how you think it'll play out, Republicans have a chance to gain their largest congressional majority since the Calvin Coolidge administration a century ago. So things are looking quite good for them. I have no idea why they think this is a particularly good issue for them to run on. Historically speaking, over the past 25, 30 years, conservatives have lost a lot of ground and a lot of cultural issues. The gun issue is one ground where conservatives have by and large been winning. I mean, a lot of purple states, light red states have been getting constitutional carry or general kind of liberalization of gun laws, uh, more generally speaking there. This is just not a good issue for Democrats. And even, the, you know, unlike the abortion issue where we've kind of seen the total and complete end of the so-called pro-life Democrat, there are still some Democrats, increasingly few, but there are still some from more rural kind of red areas. Joe Manchin's obviously a prime example who's just not going to be down with a gun control agenda because at this point, Jesse, as you and I both know, there are more firearms in circulation in America than there are our people. Whether we want to have a well-armed citizenry is an interesting academic discussion. That ship happened to sail 230 plus years ago. <laughs> okay, when the Second Amendment uh, was there in the Bill of Rights in 1791, that argument was had, we have a well-armed citizenry. And at this point, any restrictions like this will simply increase the, uh, will simply increase criminals and will hurt law-abiding citizens. Josh, you have a piece up in Newsweek about the Uvalde shooting. People are looking for answers. What's what's your take on this whole awful bit of business? Look, so Jesse, like you, I well, you still live in Texas. I I used to live in Texas. That's how we became friends years ago. I used to live in Texas, and my mother is actually an elementary school teacher. So this one actually hit home for me a little bit more. I think a lot of People have become numb to these horrific headlines. This one actually did come home for me a little bit, especially with just the horrific, horrific uh, details we are learning about police misconduct and police failure. 19 police officers standing there outside the classroom, cowardly refusing to go in, and it ultimately became Border Patrol, who had to go in after a half hour of listening to the Uvalde police officers. After a half hour, they basically said, what are we doing here? Why are we not going in? So I really want there to be accountability for what happened there as far as horrible police misconduct. And I'm generally the biggest defender of the police. Over and over again, I defend the police against the anarchists, the defund the police crowd. I repeatedly defend them. But what happens here appears to be very, very bad. But look, more gun control is simply not the answer, okay? One thing that I that I pointed out in this column at Newsweek, and I hope that this talking point gets out there a little bit more, what I would really like people to start looking at, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, we made it much, much tougher to involuntarily commit mentally ill, deranged people in this country to asylums. This is around the time that Jack Nicholson was making One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That was kind of the cultural backdrop in America at that time. But we made it much harder to get mentally ill people off the streets. All of these mass shooters share one thing in common, if nothing else. They are mentally ill, psychopathic, deranged, insane people who should not be on the streets, who should be in asylums, should be taken away from us. And if we actually start to liberalize these laws, we could also kill two birds with one stone because a large proportion of the homeless people in large cities across the country also happen to be mentally ill, actually. So that's one thing that I really hope conservatives in particular start talking about a little bit more is reforming our civil commitment laws, actually. Josh, actually, I'm glad you brought this up because I, frankly, I wanted to text you about this, this whole mental institution, mental health thing. I guess we'll probably talk off the air, too. We'll also do it in front of everybody right now. Here's what I'm worried about. I don't disagree with you about the, the need to check people into mental health facilities, but I worry about a mental health academic system that we have right now in this country that is, I mean, to say left wing would be putting it mildly. It is hardcore, hardcore to the left. And we're going to do what, Josh? Hand those people the keys to decide who should be locked away for their insane beliefs? I mean, I think they could probably listen to one episode of the Josh Hammer show and decide Josh <laughs> Hammer is not right in his mind and should be locked in a padded room. And I don't think that's out of line to think that they would use their abuse their power that way.
Jesse, it's a really good point. It's funny you should mention that, actually. I was getting drinks here in Miami last night with a friend who raised this exact same point to me, actually. It, it, it is an extremely important point. It, it's actually a pretty persuasive one. Look, it's going to get down to pragmatic prudential policymaking. I mean, the, the, the details in each policy are going to differ, whether it's at a federal level, whether it's at a state level. Certainly, I think basically what you said is basically my arguments against red flag laws, because so-called red flag laws, first of all, they don't actually work. I mean, think about New York State, which has a red flag law. It certainly did not stop the mass shooter there at the supermarket in Buffalo, New York, a couple of weeks ago. But red flag laws, it seems to me, based on my review of them so far, very little evidence is actually needed whatsoever to take away the person's guns. So you, you hold aside the fact that they're not effective in the first place. That is a massive intrusion on liberty without any semblance of due process. The kind of civil commitment laws I'm talking about would have to entail, a, obviously, a, you know, a real kind of evidentiary hearing, like a full, ideally kind of federal judicial kind of trial. I mean, real evidence, due process. I, I, I hear you loud and clear, and I think it's an extremely important point. And I think policymakers, if this were to pick up steam and this policy start to get out there, would have to bear in mind exactly what you're saying there. Because at the, at the end of the day, the worst people to empower, obviously, are left-wing bureaucrats who basically just want to throw us in the gulag. So I hear you loud and clear. I'm not sure exactly how to draw the line here, but I think we probably can thread some sort of needle. Bill Gates is a billionaire and world-renowned philanthropist. But stories of suspicious behavior and unsettling relationships have raised questions about the internet mogul. Exposed, the real Bill Gates takes an in-depth look at the man behind Microsoft and asks the questions mainstream media chooses to ignore. Don't miss Exposed, the real Bill Gates, a First TV exclusive available now for First TV supporters. Simply visit thefirsttv.com or download the First TV app to subscribe and start watching today.